Okay, welcome to another video by Adrian Davy from Pure Electric. This is video number four uh, to help with, um, uh, learners in the AM2 assessment. And all I'm doing is continuing through the AM2 pre-assessment checklist, which you can download off the net website. Okay. So in this video, I'll just be talking through section C2 or D for the AM2S, which is fault diagnosis and rectification. Your maximum time allowed is for two hours. Um, and I think you get something like seven faults to find. I think there's one on data, five on the test rig that you've just built, okay? And one on the central heating system. So you will be given five minutes to read this section and prepare for assessments and make sure you read through the specification. And before you actually do this um, fault diagnosis, you have to do the safe working practice. And this is the point where you do your um, I haven't read up the board. This is the point where you do your safe isolation, okay? Um, and you will have to isolate a, a single phase piece of equipment, three phase piece of equipment, and a three phase distribution board, at which point the board will be safe to work on. However, when you're working in the real world, what I want you to make sure is that when you're doing fault finding, you safely isolate the circuits, okay? And if you need to gain access to live parts, it's, it's dead. So, your board will be dead when you come in to do this, or it should be, and if it's not, you need to remember to safely isolate and lock off the, the uh, circuit you're working on or the consumer unit you're working on. So to demonstrate occupational competence, you will be required to identify the fault in each circuit from the information provided by the centre assessor. So from that, what I'm reading is they will give you some kind of job card, and on that job card, there will be a fault, and it will say customer experiences loss of power every time they plug a device into the socket circuit. Okay, and then you from that you need to decipher whether it's going to be a short circuit, open circuit, high resistance, or misconnection. Okay, you then have to come up with um, the points where it's between, and then you also need to come up with the rectification, which I'll talk through as well. So it says here that you then need to state and record for the faults, the type of each fault, so short circuit, open circuit, high resistance or misconnection, the specific location of each fault between two points and on what piece of equipment. So in a minute, I've got something drawn up on here, which I'll talk you through. So this is just a consumer unit. And if we were to label these points with numbers, then it would be specific between two points, which I'll get onto in a minute. Okay, how each fault could then be rectified and any additional works required to prove fault has been rectified. So what I want you to imagine when you're doing this, a so real life situation, okay, your company have asked you to go to a job, customer's got a fault, they'll tell you what the fault is or what the customer thinks the fault is. Um, and be prepared as well that sometimes a customer's interpretation of what's happening could be very loose, okay? Um, so you need to be able to read through the lines and actually work out where you're gonna start, but a lot of that comes with experience. So what your company want, they want you to go to there, to that job, they want you to find the fault, obviously if you can fix it straight away, that's great. But how I want you to play this out in your head is that um, you're only there to fault find. Then what you, need, what you need to do is you need to write a detailed report. I mean, it doesn't have to be war and peace, but enough information that you can then hand that back to your company and your company from that can prepare a quotation, okay? And from that quotation, they have enough information to for time and how many people they may need and the length of the run or something, you know? Maybe not so much length of the run for this because it's very short, but that's the kind of thing that you would do in the real life. Okay, then, what you then need to picture is that if you give them the wrong information or it's between the wrong two points, your company could then quote for the work. So a contract is formed. You then go to site to carry out that work or it may not even be you. It may be somebody else coming in off your report, going in to uh, complete that work. And when they get there, they start ripping things up, destroying things, taking things apart and realise that you haven't located the fault correctly, at which point your custom, your company is now out of pocket and your customer is very annoyed. Um, and then your company has to make that good before they can get to where the fault actually is. So you can, you can imagine this could be very costly and embarrassing, loss of reputation for a company. So you need to get it right, okay? Which is what all this is about. 
So it says here, common errors. Candidates do not correctly identify the faults. So the location of the fault should be specific, i.e. between point one and point two. If you were sent to repair a circuit, would you just replace the damaged piece of cable or rewire the whole circuit? Therefore, you need to identify the exact location of the fault. And again, in a real life situation, we always start off with the easy fix. OK, so obviously safe, safe, easy fix, not bodging it. But if it's a loose connection, then we literally just want to tighten up the loose connections, retest, off we go. If it then requires testing of the cable when you find out the cable's destroyed, OK, that is then replacing a piece of cable uh, between two points. What you don't want to do is quote for a rewire when all you needed to do was check some connections, OK, costing the customer thousands of pounds for £10 worth of work. That's the level that you need to think about. You then, so then they also, the type of fault should be described as if you were talking to another electrician. So again, you don't have to put it into um, layman's terms. You've got to be quite specific, but also with enough information that another electrician could then go off of the back of your report and carry out the work. Candidates do not record a correct method for rectifying the faults. So what would you do to repair the fault? It's no good just saying, change cable if it isn't the cable that needs changing because you'll fail it's no good saying misconnection um, when it's the cable that's damaged because then again you'll fail um, and again like i said you want to start off with checking connections first then changing the cable if need be and escalating as it goes also how would you check that your repair your repair was successful so i mean this is what i'm reading straight out of here so reading between the lines i would say that what net are telling you there is that most people forget that once they've done the repair, we then need to retest. Now, obviously, if you've just tightened up connections, then it would be just retest connections. If you run a new length of cable, then that could involve a minor work certificate um, and some testing, R1, R2 testing, insulation resistance testing, and possibly even RCD testing, depending on the type of circuit that you're working on. I mean, I don't think they give you a lot of space to write all this in, so you've got to be realistic. But those are the kinds of things that you need to think about. OK. Right. What I've got written up on the board here. So, again, we're talking about fault finding. If we were talking about a short circuit, so. Let's, let's think of a theoretical situation that an MCB or an RCBO is tripping out. OK, in that instance, we've probably got a short circuit going on. OK, we've got connection where there shouldn't be connection or something's overloaded. So for that test, if we were testing um, for cross connection, we would be testing in parallel. So two conductors in parallel, like live or neutral or live and earth, that are usually in line with each other but not touching, are now somehow the insulation's eroded or the appliances stopped working and now they're connected. OK, that's basically what we're talking about. So for that, we would be testing in parallel. Effectively, I'm going to connect one clamp onto the live conductor, one clamp onto the neutral conductor and do an insulation resistance test. Or you could use a continuity tester if it was uh, a bad enough fault. We'll come on to the types of testers that you should use in a minute because uh, it might not be as clear cut as you think it is. We could also then be talking about an open circuit. So, for instance, um, we could be talking about a light that's not working. OK, so we're switching the switch. The light's not coming on. We would then be testing in series. So we would test power from the MCB to the first point, from the first point to the second point, to the second point to the light and seeing that we've got continuity all the way through. And we're looking for a break in that con in that connection. OK, loss of continuity. We could also then be checking the neutral or the CPC. OK, high resistance joints. So again, we'll be testing in series. What we're looking for there is we've got a really high resistance piece of cable or a high, a high resistance connection and the current, the electrons can't flow. So something's not working as well as it should do. OK might not be bright enough or it might not be spinning as fast or something's not quite right. There is power, but there's it's not working as it should. Then you might have a high resistance joint. Again, you'd be testing in series. You may have a misconnection. 
Now, a misconnection could be the fact that something's not working. And if it's a loss of continuity, again, we're back to series. Okay, no problem there. If we've got a cross connection that when you're switching something on and the power's tripping out, well, now we've got a short circuit again. Okay, could it still misconnection? Because it's just connected up wrong. But again, we're testing in parallel. So those are the kinds of things that I want you to be thinking about while you're doing that. I've then put a note here that you may want to think back to dead testing, okay? Because a lot of people get confused when it comes to fault finding. Um, so what I've done is uh, think back to dead testing. When you do your R1, R2 testing, you're testing in series. You're testing for continuity. So R1 plus R2 series testing, continuity. When you're doing your insulation resistance, okay? And again, we do this before we put anything into service, before we let electricity run down the cables for the first time. We're checking for fault. So when we do insulation resistance, we're testing in parallel, okay? We're testing for short circuits. In that instance, we're putting voltage down the cables and any continuity in between will, will register as a fault. So if you get really stuck, okay, think back to uh, R1, R2 testing and insulation resistance testing, okay? With R1, R2 testing, we want continuity. With insulation resistance, we don't want continuity. And it's as simple as that. And we do that before we put it into service. So a lot of the faults that I'm imagining, the ones that people really struggle with, are the ones where they're on a ring. OK, and then you need to think about checking your end to end measurements. So little R1, little R2, little RM, and then maybe doing R1, R2 testing in a figure of eight configuration to check that you've got um, polarity at each socket and possibly even R1, RN, again, to check that you've got polarity correct at each socket. Something to think about anyway. OK, so then also as well, I've put up a boiler circuit here, which I'm just going to quickly talk through. I know it's not um, full finding as such, talking about how a boiler circuit works, but I want to talk, describe the way that I see it and the way it works in my head as a sort of flow chart. And then that will help you do fault diagnosis on a boiler system, okay? Uh, and also moving forward, help you maybe wire it as well, because if you understand how it works, then it makes it easier to connect it up. Okay, so here I've just got a simple switch fuse and a boiler, okay? In its simplest form, that's what we would have, okay? But for this, we would have to have somebody standing by the switch. So on, heating's on, off, heating's off. And then that someone's got to stand there all day, every day, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, switching that switch, which obviously isn't realistic. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to take this out and I'm going to put a timer in there. Timer, or some people call it a programmer. Okay, now that timer says whether or not it's going to come on. Fantastic. Okay, well now that I've set the timer, so it comes on two times a day, well now it's too hot, I can't control the heating, I've got no control whatsoever, the heating's just on, and I mean this may be on for four hours, so heating's just on for four hours, I'm walking around in Bermuda shorts, okay, it's that hot, I've got no control, so now I need something to control the temperature, which in our case will be a room stat, okay. Perfect, so now I've got a room stat, I've got a timer, tells when it's going to come on, I've got a room stat which is going to switch it on and off as it, the temperature gets up to the room gets up to temperature and that will fire up the boiler perfect now it is obviously a bit more complicated than that if i turn this round i've actually drawn it out a bit differently and what i've done here which i'll have to spin this round bear with me okay so i've drawn this out it's exactly the same principle but what i've done is that the programmer i've split it into heating and hot water. So this is what you might call a two channel program. And programmers, I've, I've got a, one downstairs as a three channel. So I've got underfloor heating, I've got upstairs uh, heating, and I've got hot water. It's the same principle. You would just have another leg coming off and another set of valves and another stat. It's really not difficult. So here I've got my supply coming in, my, my switch fuse spur, um, and then it comes to the programmer and I've got heating going off this way. And I've got hot water going off this way. 
So for the heating, I've got a room step, which then tells the heating valve to open, which then fires up the boiler and the pump. Now the boiler and the pump in this instance are connected together. Some boilers have a pump overrun, and in that instance, the pump may come directly off the boiler, okay? But what I've done here is I've just done a normal Honeywell system and this just connects up here. Boiler comes on, pump comes on, simple as that. So, same with the hot water. Hot water goes to a cylinder stat on the tank and then that tells the hot water valve to open and then that valve switches on the boiler and the pump. Okay, and that is, that is it in its simplicity. So let's think about some faults that you might get on a boiler system. If you've got nothing working, okay, there's no power to the programmer, well, the fault is here. It's between the fuse, switch fuse spur and the programmer, okay? If you've got a fault that happens only when the heating is on, then you're in this half of the circuit. You've either got a fault coming out of your programmer on the heating side, a fault at your room stat, or a fault at your heating valve, at which point it then comes back in again. So if the fault is on the heating side only, that's where it's gonna be. Heating side of programmer, room stat, heating valve. If you've got a fault that's only on your hot water, well again, that's on the hot water side of the programmer, to your cylinder stat, to your hot water valve, and then after that, they both join up. So again, listen to the fault that's described. If it's on the heating side, you're here, if it's on the hot water side, you're here. If the fault happens whether heating or hot water are on, okay, then you're up here. The fault is either at the boiler or the pump, okay, because both of these things come together here, and that's what's at the end of that circuit. So just bear that in mind. That's why I've drawn it out in this way. I mean, if you guys want to draw this at home just to get your heads around it, I mean, you won't be able to have that on the day, but you could draw it out. I mean, theoretically, if they've given you a piece of paper on the day, you can write, you could draw this out, I'm sure, okay, because it's coming out of your head, you're not bringing it in. And then once you draw that out, it will help you fault find. I mean, don't forget as well, on the day, you will have already installed the heating system, you will have all the wiring controls, so it should be fairly simple. But there we go, that's, it. that's, that's that in its simplistic form. There are different variants to this. Like I said, you could have the pump coming off the boiler. You could have a three channel programmer and something else coming over here. It's all, it's all relative. So read the fault, think about where it is. If it happens with nothing on, you're at the bottom half of this circuit. If it happens with one leg, you're on either side of here. And if it happens when both things are on, you're up the top. Okay, let me spin this back round and we'll carry on going. Okay, so. Over here, I've just drawn out two simple circuits. I mean, you're either doing, dealing with a ring or you're dealing with a radial. The, the, the principles apply. So if you're dealing with a ring, then you, you may have to test a ring depending on the fault. If you've got a short circuit, then chances are something's connected the wrong way round um, or you've got a cross connection. So let's imagine a, a real life scenario. The MCB or the RCBO is tripping out regardless of whatever's plugged into it, okay? That says to me that I've got a fault either between live and neutral or between live and earth on a cable. At which point you then need to tell, tell the people you need to tell your company where the fault's between. So let's label these. Let's imagine that this consumer unit is point number one. Okay, hopefully you guys can see that. So there's point number one. Let's make this point number two, three, four, five. Okay. I might as well number them all up while I'm here. So then we've got six, seven, eight, and nine is the light. Okay, so we've got nine points here. In this instance then, the fault's gonna be between point one and point two. Now I have to prove that. I see a lot of apprentices 
say they're going to split the ring. And then all they do is they take the lives of the neutrals in the Earths out of the MCB and out of the neutral bar and out of the Earth bar. Okay, And they think that's splitting the ring. That isn't splitting the ring. That's literally just opening up the, the ring. It's not split. It's still, at that point, um, it is still at that point going round in a circle. Okay, Let's see if I can do this in one go. best of drawings. Right, let's imagine that's your ring, okay? If all you do is take the lives of neutrals and herbs out of the consumer unit, all you've done is that, okay? That isn't splitting the ring, that's just opening the ring. The reason people say to split the ring is so that if you were looking at these four circuits down here, because I know they're in a ring formation and I know where the centre of the circuit is, if I was to split it here, okay, that's splitting the ring. What I've done is I've created two radial circuits that are separate of each other. Now what I can do is I can test one leg of the ring and see if the fault is on there. Well, in this instance, I'll test this one. I'll do insulation resistance between live and earth, live and neutral, and I'm not going to get any fault. It's going to be fine, okay? So I test the other leg of the ring. In between, on this leg, I'm going to find a fault, at which point I've all got two sockets to choose from. Well, the only way to separate those two sockets is to disconnect it in the socket. I'll test this leg up to here. I found the fault. I need to prove the fault doesn't go any further from there. So what I'll do is I'll test it then from that socket onwards, prove there's no fault, and then I know the fault is between point one and point two. Okay. If, let's connect these back up again, and again obviously I'm, I'm just rubbing this out here, you wouldn't cut the cable, you would disconnect it out of the back of a socket. However, for me to wipe that out, there's a lot of effort to draw it back in again, so I'm just doing this for simplicity, obviously you'd disconnect out of socket. If I was looking for a fault, where's the orange pen? That might indicate the fault better. If I was checking for a, uh, a fault here, between live and earth, okay, so there's my fault. Again, I could split the ring. I could either do it at this socket or split it at this socket, at which point I will end up with that. So again, I'm just wiping that out just to show the split. It would really be in the socket. Again, I would test one leg of the ring. That would be fine up to here, so I know it's not on these sockets and then I would test this leg of the ring, and then I'd find out the fault was here, I would then split it here, like this, that's even on that side. I would know that that leg is okay up to that socket, and then I would test from this socket to this socket, I would find the fault still, so I would disconnect it in this socket, and I would find out it's on this leg of the ring here, okay? Uh, and that, that's all it is. Uh, if it was a misconnection, so let's put that into a real life situation. Let me just draw this back in for clarity. If we were talking about a real life situation where the circuit is fine, it doesn't trip out until somebody plugs something in, at which point it then trips out. Well, that says to me that we've got a fault at a socket. Okay, if it's only happening at one socket in, in particular, then chances are that's the socket that's got the fault. Something I should probably mention about this is these faults that they create on the AM2 bays or in any bay or in any test situation, they're not real faults. Okay, they're manufactured, they've been installed, they don't always behave in the way that they would in the real world. It's the best that people can do in this situation. Um, you know, if, so for instance, if someone had connected up live and neutral the wrong way round, 
okay, in the back of a socket. In a real life situation, you would drop that socket off the back and you would see the cables are the wrong way around. You would put your socket tester in and it would say these, you know, the lights would light up and it would say that this is the wrong way around. Clarity is the wrong way around. At which point you would just take the cables out, change them. Obviously, so that you can't find that that easily, what they've done is they've taken this section of cable and changed it in the back of the board somewhere so that you can't see it. Okay, there'll be some trunking that you can't undo and the fault's going to be manufactured, introduced by way of a switch. Okay, so when you're looking for these faults, it can sometimes be really confusing because you know in your head that this is not real. You're going to have to do your best to work your way through it. Okay, it is what it is. Okay, if we were sort of talking about someone plugging something in and then it's tripping out, well, that might happen on a specific socket and that might be reverse polarity. Okay, the neutral could be in the wrong terminal. The live could be in the wrong terminal. And when you're plugging something in, it's then tripping out. Okay, which you then would then, all you would then do, sorry, is you'd do polarity testing at each socket. Now, because because the circuit's so small and you can literally reach it with your testers, it's not like in a real house where you can stand at the board and touch every socket. What you could do in this instance, and then just to point out as well, I'm using this TIS 859 um, continuity tester, which actually I really like. I've got to point this out. Um, I'll show you why I like it. Uh, you can with this particular tester. It's got these retractable tips. Okay. Now with continuity testing, that's something else I should talk about while we're doing this. If I pull these tips back and press really hard on there, on the ends, this tester tells me I've got continuity. Okay. It's picking up the continuity in my body. So if I was testing a cable, for instance, so I've got a piece of cable here, okay? One piece goes around in a circle. If I was testing this for continuity and I use my fingers to press on the ends, well, I don't know whether that's the cable or my fingers, okay? Because I'm pressing with my fingers. I could literally just be doing that. So you've got to be really careful. Now, when the TIS rep come round, uh, just before Christmas, I was having a play with these. And do you know what? I actually really like the feel of these. And I like the fact it's got that symbol on there, which basically means gate open. And if I touch it together, if I can touch it together, gate closed, gate open. Oh, how, how cool is that? Um, but when I was having a play with them, I realised that you can, in fact, on these, not very well, but you could, Put these crocodile clamps on the end like so okay and because they're so thick at the end they actually fit in there all right so if I was doing some continuity testing with these what I could do is put that on there and that's through the crocodile clamps okay how cool is that now I've got to say it's not perfect because these are sprung loaded. It does keep firing these off the end. That's not going to do it now. Come on. Won't do it for the camera. Oh, there you go. So it does, it does fire them off the end. So the other good thing about these testers is that this L1 cable is actually on a plug. So you can take that out and you can put in a lead. So this is from my Mega, okay? Because all it is is just a four mil jack from my Mega. And now that clamps on there a lot better because it's not sprung loaded. Perfect, okay? So if there are any manufacturers out there that provide continuity testers, it might be worth doing it so that you can actually get crocodile clamps on the end. Just a thought. But the point of that, the moral of that story was, 
that when you're doing it, make sure that you're not picking up continuity for, you, for yourself, okay? Right, so, back to the point. Because this is such a small circuit and you can literally stand by your consumer unit and dab into every point. And let's say we've got a fault. Let's say the lives and the neutrals are the wrong way around, for instance. What we can do is we can plug that in there. We can dab that into the socket, put that on our board, and then that will tell me whether my continuity is correct, my polarity is correct at that socket. I could switch it off, switch it on, and it would tell me. I could then move to every socket doing the same thing, flicking the switch and making sure the continuity is okay. I could then, once I've done the live, I could then do the neutral. So I'll put that into the neutral, test the neutral, continuity, 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 and I can also do the earth. I could then put that into the earth and do the same. Continuity, 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 continuity. If I had a cross connection, then it would show up. So all I'm doing is neutral to neutral, continuity yes, continuity yes, continuity yes, continuity yes, live, continuity yes, continuity yes, continuity yes, continuity yes, and earth all the way around. So if I had a misconnection in here, so let's say for instance, let's do this. So that comes through there, and in fact that is connected into the neutral pin. Okay. When I test for neutral here, and I test in there, because it's not joined, I won't get continuity. That will send alarm bells ringing. I would then think, well, hang on a minute, what is in there? I'll go to my live. Okay, the live's in the wrong pin. Or it could be the earth's in the wrong pin. And that would just be a really simple way of doing it. If you were doing this out on site though, like I said, you would probably just Use your socket tester and that would tell you whether polarity was wrong or if you were doing it dead test then you would do your R1, R2 and R1, RN testing. Okay. Now I should probably just mention for safety reasons we are not supposed to be working live or gaining access to live parts. Again with the ring R1, R2 testing, R1, R2 end testing, end to end testing, and insulation resistance, okay? Over here, I've now got a lighting circuit. So in this instance, again, if the fault was something's tripping out, well, then I've got a short circuit. So whether that's between live to neutral or live to earth, could be up here. Just notice there's a little missing there. So if I had a fault here, every time I flick the switch on, the light trips out. Well, I've got continuity between live and neutral. So what I would then do is I would test with the switch on, obviously, between live and neutral. And if I've got continuity, I've got a fault. Now, for that to work with these and with an insulation resistance tester, I need to remove the lamp, okay? Because otherwise that's gonna give me a false reading, okay? So I disconnect the lamp, test between live and neutral, still got a fault. Now I need to work out which switch it's between and which point. So what I would then do is disconnect this cable here out of the light, test it there, and I would prove the fault. Now one of the things I'll make it um, clear as well is that it's really easy to think where the fault is when you've got it drawn out in, in front of you. I always find when I'm doing fault finding, it doesn't matter how clever I try to be, it always seems to be the last place that I test. So if I go on previous experience and think, right, I'll split the ring, or I'll split the ring, and now I'll test back this way, it always, it's always the last point. I don't know whether it's just me, could be other people, but it's usually the last point. Um, 
what experience teaches you is how to try and find it quicker. So you're not having to take everything apart to find it. Uh, if I didn't know it was at the last point, again, what I could do is I could disconnect the live out of here. Okay, the live and the neutral. And I would, I'd only have to disconnect one. I could test here, no fault. I could then reinstate that. And I could take the live out of here. And I could test there, no fault. Okay, so I know it's not there. I could then take the live out of this switch, test between live and neutral, no fault. And, and it's basically just a process of elimination. Sometimes you'll get lucky and you'll find it straight away, other times you won't. And you'll be scratching your head, scratching your head, scratching your head, trying to find it. Um, fault finding is just one of those things, guys. There is no quick route. So with that in mind, if you're trying to find the quick route of doing it, and you're trying to skip sections, skip steps, should I say, chances are you're going to miss it quite easily. So for instance, what I mean by that, if we go back to the ring, if you don't do R1, R2 testing or R1, RN testing, you could quite easily miss a polarity issue. Okay, um, something as simple as that. Okay. So we've spoken about that. Okay, on the lighting circuit then. So short circuit with literally just between live and neutral, neutral, uh, live and out, sorry. Lots of continuity where that could be something's not connected up. So let's connect, connect this circuit back up again. If I had a loose connection in the neutral, for instance, that wasn't connected up properly. Well, what I could do is obviously with the circuit dead, I would test between live to the light and I would flick the switch on, test it, flick the switch off, test it, flick the switch on, test it, flick the switch off, working my way back. So I'd go on, off, on, off, on, all the way through the circuit, testing between the, um, uh, the supply and the switch live. And if I had continuity all the way through, then I would know that it's not a switch line conductor that's gone wrong or a feed. That then leaves me with the neutral, at which point I would put this on the neutral, here neutral at the lamp, and I wouldn't get continuity because I've got this break here. Then all you have to do is go through the circuit. You could split the circuit in half and start at the intermediate switch in this instance and check here. If you've got it, then you know it's between there and there. Or if you haven't got it, you know it's between here and the board. Okay. Again, if I was if, if I was looking between here, it would be between 0.7 and 0.8. Okay, from this point on. Right. I think I think that's about it. Again, up here, what I've done is I've put. Don't forget safe isolation when you're fault finding. It's very important. Don't forget, you've got to label the type of fault, so whether it's a short circuit, an open circuit, high resistance or misconnection. You've got to be specific about the location, okay? So between two points. So it's got to be specific. So you've got, if, you, if, you, if anyone came back to rectify this fault, they would know where to look, okay? And what they don't want to do is lift a load of floorboards and find out actually it's not between the consumer unit and this socket, it's between this socket and this socket. And then who's going to pay for that? Okay. Rectification, what needs to be done? So if it's a misconnection, well, that just needs uh, re-terminating, okay, and reconnecting up correctly, and then retesting to make sure that it works afterwards. Again, the retest is the important part of well gents because, or guys, should I say, um, if you don't test something's working and you go away, get home, put your feet up open a beer, start drinking, boss phones you up and says, oh, I've got the customer back on the phone, it's still not working. Well, that's loss of reputation, loss of earnings, plus you've now got to go back. You can't because you've been drinking, that means someone else has got to go back. You're not looking good, okay? So you need to prove that it works before you leave. So what needs to be done? And then prove and retest. So how are you going to prove it, okay? So is that just going to be, R1, R2 testing, because it's dead testing. 
if it was a short circuit you might need to do insulation resistance okay to prove that that cable is okay right finally I've just quickly drawn up a data cable as well because one of the faults I think is on a data cable I've tried to keep it simplistic so all we've got here is uh, orange and white orange green and white green blue blue and white brown brown and white okay and I haven't drawn the connections that I ran all I've done is numbered them okay now again with this issue all you're going to be testing is end-to-end -end. so have I got continuity at terminal number one here and terminal number one here terminal two to terminal two terminal three to terminal three terminal six to terminal six and so on what they'll probably give you is a test tester like this and all you do with these is you put in a cable which you would then connect into your um, data points okay you would switch this on and you would see the lights going down and all the time they're in synchronicity okay so look one two three then that's connected up correctly okay now what I've done here is I've connected up a faulty cable where someone's done the connection wrong to symbolise what would happen if this was cross connected. Okay, so as we watch this go down, when it gets to five and six, you'll notice that they're no longer synchronised. Okay, so hopefully you can see that. So look, one, two, three, four, five and six are cross connected. Okay, and then you would know that the fault was between five and six. If you were testing this and the lights were going down on the left hand side, but not on the right hand side. So, for instance, let's say this was going down and it on the left hand side, it missed out number six. Then you would know that this number six here is not connected. Okay. For some reason, either at this end or at this end, number six wasn't connected, the light's not flashing for continuity. Well, all you need to do in that instance is you just need to make sure that the punch down tool has pushed it in between the insulation displacement uh, connections at the end. If you've got cross connection, so literally, it's just I'm just going to wipe these out for simplicity because it's easier than drawing the cables out. So let's say that's one and two. Well, one at this end is orange, but at this end it's orange and white. Well, I've got a cross connection. So what I would have to do is just swap those back round again. Okay, and that would literally just be hooking the cable out of the, the terminal, swapping it into the correct terminal and punching it back down again. And that's about, that's about all there can be on a Cat5 cable or data cable, shall I say. Um, it's either going to be uh, connection, misconnection, or continuity has gone wrong. Right, okay. If you're testing, if you're testing the boiler system, I'll just finish with this. If you're testing the boiler system, don't forget that you need to test the accessory separately to the cable, if you can. So, for instance, um, a pump on a on a heating system um, they don't usually come flexed you've got to flex them up most these days have push-in terminals so literally like way goes you push the tab down you pull the terminal out if you've got a fault at your pump so whether that's a live air fault or a live neutral fault or a neutral air fault possibly okay a you test the cable to the pump with the pump connected if you prove that the fault is in that leg of the circuit then what you would do is at the pump you would then disconnect the pump from the cable you would test the cable prove it whether it's the cable or not and then you would test the pump prove whether it's the pump or not okay and then that would just be change of accessory all right or something along those lines and then retest at the end other than that i don't really know what else i can sort of guide you towards it's easy when you've got it drawn up on a board and when you're talking about it. 
always a bit of a head scratcher sometimes when you're on site but you guys will be fine you just need to think your way through it okay so what type of fault have i got if it's tripping out it's almost certainly going to be short circuit or misconnection where someone's crossed their lives and the earth's over or something if it's something's not working then we've got loss of continuity and then that way we need to literally just test between points so test from here to here here to here here to here we're testing in series okay um and that's it okay well i hope this video's been helpful um hit me back with the feedback in the comments or whatever and i'll get back to you guys with with some answers take care cheers